In case you need the presentations right away, the most updated copy, there's a link that I put down here. I'll zoom into it just in case. So uh, I put all my presentations at this location, bit.ly slash Asif Conference, just in case. Although Steve and the team here have been really good about making everything available pretty quickly on the site. All right. So that's just stuff about me. I don't think you need to know too much. I, I give a more pictorial view in the next slide, I think. No, I, maybe not. I thought I did. Anyway, uh, SharePoint MVP, Microsoft Certified Trainer. I've been working on SharePoint stuff for a long time, mostly <clears throat> writing, speaking, training, consulting, mentoring, keeping people out of trouble, kind of SharePoint stuff. Sometimes succeeding, sometimes not. <laughs> so the agenda, I already covered my own stuff. I'm going to also cover just one minute for what our company does, and it might be able to help you guys with what you do as well, especially for power users. And then we'll jump in directly to the importance of going no code. Why should we care? Why does it matter? Then examples of no code solutions. And then we'll talk about some links and resources after this session, because you won't be able to see everything here, of course. We've only got 60 minutes, minus five minutes already. For those of you who came in late, my name is Asif Ramani from Chicago. Glad to be here. Let's get started, all right? So as I was saying before, here's actually a little bit more pictorial view of me. I won't cover that. Anybody been to my session before? Nobody? All right. Hopefully, this is not the last one you come to. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, about our company. So like I was saying, I've been involved since 2002. And then about 2006, uh, approximately, is when we did start some of that stuff in our, in our company as well. Uh, two main things. One is the Visual SP help system that we developed from our company. And the second thing is the Visual SP Training Center. And I'll just give you a quick view of that, and then we'll jump in the presentation. <coughs> One of the main issues since the beginning has been in SharePoint community has been SharePoint adoption, getting people to actually use what you create, right? And uh, this is the reason we came up with this thing a few years back. Basically, a help tab that follows the user around everywhere they go within SharePoint. So the help tab will have all these different things, like uh, video tutorials, screenshots, uh, documents, or even links to other stuff that you want them to go to, and all in context and on demand. So wherever they are, this changes, and it's all controllable by the SharePoint administrator. We found this to be really, really helpful to folks quite a bit. Second thing, something we've been doing for a really long time, even before that, is just all kinds of tutorials on SharePoint. So a lot of folks that you see here, like John Holiday, Mark Anderson, Agnes, and all, they've all done tutorials for us. I've done tutorials as well. And it's all different stuff uh, that you see on the site. 900 and some tutorials uh, so far. And in fact, I actually brought somewhere <clears throat> something to give away as well. I like to do giveaways. You guys like giveaways? Yeah. OK, that's good. That's good to hear. So I do have one giveaway. And that's the one year access to the site. And that's uh, usually worth 200 US dollars. In case you would like to attend to participate in this raffle, just throw your card or your name and email address in here, and we'll do a raffle at the end, all right? Completely optional, if you would like. All right. <clears throat> so I'm assuming all of you have been into this SharePoint realm, the SharePoint mud. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to call it mud. Sorry, SharePoint. SharePoint for a long time, yeah? Or, OK, how about more than five years? How many? All right, uh, more than two years? More than one? So, so are there folks who are brand new? It seems like there are a few who are brand new to SharePoint. Is that right? Anybody? It's OK. A couple of you? All right. Well, those of you around you, I'm sure they're going to say, yeah, SharePoint can do a lot of stuff. This is a question I get asked all the time. And yes, SharePoint can do a lot of stuff. In fact, it's hard to imagine what SharePoint cannot do. Of course, our focus is going to be what do we do as SharePoint uh, power users, especially SharePoint Online. But let's just talk about quickly what SharePoint can do. Collaboration, forms, business automation, process, workflows, search, so much stuff, right? Now, you guys know SharePoint 2016 is coming? So I'll share a secret with you. Super secret, NDA. Let's close the doors. Make sure nobody's paying attention. All right, you guys ready? So in SharePoint 2016, SharePoint will make coffee as well. <laughs> that's the only thing that's remaining, honestly. Everything else it can do. Having said that, <clears throat> just because it can do everything 
It doesn't mean that it does everything super well. <laughs> okay? So there are things it does amazing. There are things it does pretty good. Then it do, there are things which are, you know what, still developing and still on, on its path. And I'm going to be talking about all these different things as well. And I'll point out those caveats. I don't wear a Microsoft badge. Uh, and I like to tell our customers straight up, you know what, this is something that's in its infancy right now. This is a matured functionality. And here, maybe this is in the middle. So as we go through stuff, I'll tell you that stuff as well. As far as creating solutions on SharePoint goes, the SharePoint platform, here's what I recommend always. And it's worked pretty well for all of our customers so far for the last 13 years now. Always, always, always look at the browser-based functionality first. What can I do with using web parts and lists and libraries and forms and, and stuff that's already there instead of me looking for a tool to make it happen? There's a lot of stuff you can do. Many of you already know that if you've already been working in SharePoint for a long time. Second, let's look into no-code tools. Uh, so I've written a few books actually on SharePoint Designer, InfoPath stuff. Since then, the direction of some of that stuff has changed, but then other tools have come into play as well. All right? Look in those tools. See what you can do without code, but with the no-code tools, including Power, uh, I'm sorry, including uh, Office tools even, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, even that way you can do some stuff. Now, the third thing, I used to have it three and four, but as you can probably hopefully see, uh, number three now, instead of three and four, I have use code tools or use third-party products. The reason I changed this, honestly, is uh, because I've seen my customers get hurt again and again when they were developing solutions, and then the next version of SharePoint came out, they had to kind of scrap all that stuff, and they had to start all over again. That happened with branding for master pages. That happened with workflows uh, in SharePoint 2010, all coded, but now it's declarative workflows, even in Visual Studio. I don't know if you guys have done that yet or not. But in Visual Studio, it's very much declarative in nature, as opposed to what it used to be. So there's a lot of stuff that you have to retool. And sometimes I was not able to advise my customers to the best of my ability, because I just didn't know exactly what was going to happen five years down the road, and they had to scrap that stuff and start over again. So I'm a little hesitant saying, you know what? Do this as far as you feel comfortable, or look into third-party products as well, because then it's their problem to make sure everything you know, in the middle is good and everything is working. I'm not recommending specifically anybody. I'm just saying, you know, take a look at that before you go all, co all code. Here's a motto that I live by, and I tell all of our, all of our customers live by as well, that don't, let's not write code until you have to write code. So before 2005, I think, uh, 2006, I used to be a developer. I did, uh, believe it or not, SharePoint 2013 curriculum, uh, whole development, uh, and I taught that for a long time. <laughs> that was something. Anyway, but since then, uh, I started taking a view, 2006 and beyond, that you know what? You don't have to use that hammer called Visual Studio for everything. Do you agree? Now, that hammer is a very powerful hammer. Agree. Absolutely. It's very, very valuable as well. And there are many, many times where you cannot get away without writing code. But having said that, I've had people come through my class saying, you know what, I wish I knew what I know now. Six months ago, it would have saved me so much time. And these are developers saying what they could have done without code. And the whole maintenance, everything else becomes easy too. So let's talk about it. Let's define no code before we go further into it. Browser-based stuff, no code. Office applications, no code. Desktop applications, as I was mentioned before, <clears throat> InfoPath, SharePoint Designer, even a Dashboard Designer, Reporting uh, Designer Tool, Report Builder, all these things are no-code tools. And then this is debatable. I go back and forth, you know, depending on who I'm talking to. Scripting technologies <laughs> such as JavaScript, jQuery, VBScript, that kind of stuff. Some people say, you know what, as as if you see a semicolon in front of a statement, that's code. Uh, I say, yes, maybe, kind of. I look at managed code, which gets compiled as truly code. Everything else is much easier. So maybe, I don't know, that, that's up to you how you want to define it. But that's how I define it, yeah? The benefits of no code should be obvious. But just in case, the possibilities are pretty enormous. And I'll show you some of these here. Then there's a quick learning curve. You know, you don't have to go through a whole class of understanding the fundamentals of Visual Studio first before you can get into the libraries of SharePoint. What can SharePoint offer now and go from there? No, you don't have to do that. Easier ongoing management of solution. 
So once you've developed it, now, I don't know if, if you've ever gone through this situation, but I've gone through this too many times where I'm done developing a solution and, oh, wait a minute, requirements have changed, is what I hear. <laughs> all right? So now you have to go back into it at some you know, part of the release. All right, we'll have to retool this thing and do it again. And those requirements change constantly these days. There's so much going on in business, right? And also, delegation of the responsibility also becomes much easier. You, whenever you make a solution, you can actually delegate it instead of having to depend on that one or five developers always. So, having said all that stuff, let's jump into something. What I want to talk about first, and I'll be talking about a few different things, including access and a little bit of InfoPath 2 and SharePoint Designer workflows, search web parts. Uh, I think there must be something else. I think there's one more thing that I'm forgetting right now. Anyway. All these things that I talk about, all of them will be available or are available in SharePoint Online and uh, on-premises, all right, on-prem. So keep that in mind. Starting with this thing, <clears throat> the search-based initiatives that Microsoft put into SharePoint 2013 or SharePoint Online are pretty huge, actually, right? In fact, many companies who were kind of hesitating going into SharePoint went into it because of search. Uh, as you probably already know because of your own experience or you've seen people doing it, one of the main reasons SharePoint has become successful since the beginning has been the document management capabilities in it, right? It just becomes a true document store. Just throw it in SharePoint, throw it in SharePoint, right? That's number one still. This is a close number two, search capabilities. A lot of stuff you can do with SharePoint search, which is much, much, much cheaper and more powerful many times than other solutions out there. Anyway, having said that, <clears throat> What about SharePoint Online right now? What can you do? So how many fo folks have already uh, made a search-based solution in SharePoint Online? Anybody? All right. And you guys can also pitch in if, with more ideas if you want. All right? So I'll show you some basics. Uh, here's the deal, though, before I go into it. When I usually talk about search, people think of this. All right? Go. And then here's a query. So that's the traditional search that we've gotten used to. Great. For this to work, a user needs to understand what they're looking for. I need to have an idea, a starting point. I'm looking for a particular thing, click on go, and I get my results. And now we've all been spoiled because of, you know, that company begins with a G, <laughs> right? Everything is at our disposal right now. And uh, if you play the cards right, you could do it on internet, you could do it on extranet, you could do it on intranet as well. But, but that's all pull. I need to know something, I'm pulling information. What about pushing information to the users? Let's talk about that. So in this case, it's not this. What I'm gonna be talking about is the following. So that's, that's this. We'll talk about something like this, where you present information, let's use different color, to the user. And that information they come to, so that's the body of the page, uh, when they're looking for a specific topic, a subject area or something. So they're looking for HR information or they're looking for healthcare or something, whatever that they have in mind and they want the most updated information within their company or their organization and they come to this page and they get the most updated, organization, uh, updated data. Traditionally, it's always been, all right, we go make a page and we manage that information on the page. As things come about, we go and manage the information. You don't have to. Here's what we can do. All right. <clears throat> so my demo is going to be on Office 365, SharePoint Online. Once again, you can do the same exact thing on premises as well. I'm going to go ahead and make a new page. Gear, add a page. I already have a bunch of uh, te template pages here, so I'm going to go ahead and do something for Evolutions. Let's go. Evolutions 2015. That's just the name of the page. Gives me a blank canvas to start from. What I want to do is throw some information or some, uh, uh, well, a structure over here which gives the users a specific type of data about a specific topic whenever they come to this page. So I'll click on insert web part and as you must have guessed because we're talking about search, I'm gonna to go to search. The options that I have are the following. Right, refinement, search box, search navigation, search results. I'm gonna use search results web part. So search results, add, here it is. 
Great, right? Just kidding. <laughs> Nothing there yet. Uh, edit web part. And once I go into edit, now this button right here, super important. Change query. Let's click on it. What's going to come up is going to be the query designer. And in this window, I can go ahead and design my query, either by typing it in directly here if I know the query parameters and uh, how do I make it, or using the keyword filter and property filter and the, uh, and even before that, the select a query uh, method here to build my query for my data set that I'm looking for. So the options that I have, a bunch of these different things over here, query from the search box, <clears throat> value of a token coming from the URL, like query parameter, uh, and then, you know, name of the user who runs the query to make it personal to the person actually who's running the query. A lot of good stuff you could do. And for property filters, it's not just the, these many. Uh, I don't know why they don't show this by default because it just makes sense to show the whole thing by default. Show all managed properties will show you lots of stuff here. Things like account, account name, assigned to, author, content type, companies, created by, all right, I'm gonna look for a specific one, file type. Okay, so then you can do contains or equals or whatever you wanna do. In my case, I'll leave contains. And then here also, to finish this query, file type contains, and then it could be, well, it could contain something that's coming in uh, through the URL as a query parameter, or it contains today's date, or today's date minus five days in this case, or other things like that. For me, I'm gonna choose manual. So I can just dump something in here. PPTX, add property filter. Now, when I click on add property filter, it's gonna take this and put it right here. So I could have typed this in directly if I wanted to, if I knew how to. Uh, I don't need that first one actually, that was already there by default. So let me take that out and then test the query and see what happens. So I'm looking for a file type that has PPTX, PowerPoint, right? 92 records, great. Now, building on my query here, space, query from the search box, that's good, add keyword filter. So the same thing that I deleted before comes back. Now, oops, excuse me. Then I'll put in over here the word Contoso. I know a bunch of my documents and pages and stuff have the word Contoso in it. So I'll have it do that search, yeah? Contoso, test query. So instead of 92 now, now we have 25. So in this way, you make your query. You either type it in once you become an expert or you just use these uh, query builder parameters here, use the refiners and sorting and all that good stuff to make your query. Once you're done, and we know what I'm gonna do actually, I'm gonna take this first parameter out Reason being that I want it to be a little bit more dynamic, and I'll show you what that, what that means when the users come to it. So once I'm done making my query, which currently is gonna return a bunch of results, everything but Contoso, let's see. 491 records, I'm satisfied, I'll click on OK, and I'll click on OK, and that should hopefully give me the results. Great, simple enough. <clears throat> Nothing too complex yet, right? I want to be, like I said before, more dynamic to the user. So when they come in here, I want them to be able to refine my results even further, or refine the results that they're seeing even further. So I'll first of all go ahead and structure this a little bit. Go in here and click on insert, click on table, and say, let's add a couple of columns here. Sorry, it's getting cut off just a little bit, but you can see it, right? Okay, so two columns. And then I'll take this web part and I'm gonna drag it to this location right here. Great. And in this first column here, I'll click on insert, web part, refinement web part, okay? Refinement web part, add. And I'll do this to connect them together. You do have to do that, by the way. I'm not kidding, okay, never mind. All right, anyway, so <laughs> these are connected together now. I didn't really have to do anything except this, right? So if you don't do it, that's fine too. We'll do it by itself. Anyway, so 
because I have a search results web part and the refinement web part, when I throw it on the page, automatically understood that there's a results web part there it attached itself to it. Now it's showing me some of the managed uh, metadata in this case, uh, result type, author, let's see, what else you got, modified date, and then I can go ahead and uh, search using those. I can say, you know what, show me all these documents that were uh, between one year ago to one month ago. And there we go. Only six results here. All right, maybe I'll make it bigger again because this is the biggest data set right here. But this time, I'll go ahead and change so only Excel shows up. Here it is. Uh, not just that, but stuff made by Garth Fort. And there it is, right? Faceted navigation, something that we're so used to these days from Amazon and other places over there. Users should be used to it as well. We throw the result set on there for them, and they're all set. Doesn't take that, that long to make it happen. And then, of course, you can enhance the data set further uh, if you wanted to using display templates, I believe. What's his name? Matt McDermott, uh, I believe, in his session. Uh, so when you get the DVDs and stuff, you should watch his, because I believe he talked about search display templates and how you can make it look prettier and, and all, right? Yeah, I think he probably showed his dogs, right? Can you see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he loves his dogs. All right. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, that's the search based web solution, uh, you know, just a ex small example of it. There's, of course, so much more you could do with it, but I just wanted to give you a preview of what you could do with it without using any desktop solutions, without using any code whatsoever. You want to say something? Yeah. Could you, um, if you wanted to have, say, search results of, of PowerPoint and then another search results, would the refinement work or not? Would you have to have them? Would uh, both of them? Have two, yeah. Have two search results. Sure, sure, refinement sure. Uh, oh, would it pick up automatically? That I have not tried. Okay. Maybe afterwards we could try it. If it but if it, if it does not pick it up, you can always go ahead and connect it to the two. Yeah. And there's also, you know, you could, you could get creative and use uh, the, what do you call those, filter web parts. You could use those also to take the information from here and throw it over there. It, it definitely could be done. Very good point. All right. <clears throat> Moving on forward, since we have a lot of good stuff over here to talk about, that's just one of the things you could do in Shipman Online and on-prem, right? Using search-based web solutions. So go crazy with it. There's, you know, get, get uh, creative to do what you need to do to present the information to yourself and to your users. Uh, and honestly, what I, what I always say about making these solutions is you want to be creative to make quick wins and quick solutions for folks, for uh, the people who actually are depending on you. Uh, involving real pain points. Looking for the pain points and focusing in on them to resolve that. Yeah? You guys know what pain point is, right? Yeah, you're like, of course, come on. English pain points, it's easy. That's what I thought. I thought I knew. I'm about to actually publish a blog on this in a few days because of my personal experience of, you know what, what we thought was a pain point was not a pain point. I don't want to bore you with the whole story right now. Maybe you could look at my blog later to see exactly what, I was, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but just, just in a nutshell, something that seems so obvious because this process was completely manual in nature, you know, making something Excel, dashboard, printing it out, giving it to somebody else, and we thought it was broken, it was not. So make sure we understand the pain point. I have made the mistakes of uh, going down that route saying, oh yeah, if you build it, they will come, and that doesn't always happen, especially not in the SharePoint world, as I'm sure many of you know. The SharePoint adoption always is hurts, well, I shouldn't say always, but it hurts many organizations where they have amazing looking portals. And they're just wondering, what, this is so beautiful, why aren't you coming and using it? It's just not happening. It has to involve some pain points, and that's when it works, in my opinion. In fact, I'm doing another session, the second session that I'm doing is gonna be on adoption and on ending end user chaos, basically. So I'll talk more about that in that session uh, Wednesday. Moving onwards, though. <clears throat> Drilling into the customization continuum as to where do you start and what do you do when you have a certain idea as to here's a pain point that I want to solve. My recommendation, as well as uh, Microsoft as well, actually, because this is some of the data I got from them after collaborating. Uh, first, you want to go customize SharePoint out of the box. Do what you can do without any other tool, using just sites, documents, lists, you know, social aspects of things, things like that. And that's kind of like moving furniture around making things prettier in your house. Then you go in deeper, and that's document sets, records center, records management, search-based solutions. 
Still, some assembly required, but easy to do, right? Now, going in further, composites, a name that came about, I believe, in SharePoint 2010, when that came about. Using different tools like Access, or Report Builder, or Dashboard Designer, or SharePoint Designer, or InfoPath, or things like that to make things happen. And that's now a little bit more complex. So not an end, end user would not be the one doing this, but a power user or even a developer should definitely be doing this before they jump into the final thing, which is you know using code, building apps, using client-side object model, reusable components, all that good stuff. And that, to me, is when you're kind of gutting out your kitchen altogether and making things everything from scratch. Okay? Think about this thing. You made these all these cabinets and stuff like that, and they look beautiful, and one gets chipped. <laughs> good luck, right? These are all custom made. So just like that, I recommend personally at least, and Microsoft agrees as well, look into these areas. When this is not possible, then go with that. All right. Having said that, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit more about other tools. Guess who's making a comeback? Anybody know which application I want to put up here now? InfoPath? No, that's on the other way around. It's <laughs> on its way out. Access, yes. Microsoft Access. So Microsoft Access is the new level of fare uh, for, for Microsoft. Uh, I used to use Microsoft Access all the time back in 2000 <laughs> or 97. And then I kind of stopped using it for a long, long, long time. I don't know about you guys. But there were many issues, right? There were always these barriers as to which I, what I could do in my desktop right here and how many connections I could accept in my databases. And then things happened like, ah, oh, the scalability is not there. The power is not there. I started going to SQL or Oracle also at, at that time uh, quite a bit. But now Microsoft is making a huge comeback with Microsoft Access, not just the desktop itself, but the components of Access within SharePoint. So having said that, here's what's happening with Access Online, Access Services. <clears throat> For this thing, you do need Access 2013. You do need either SharePoint Online and, or uh, on-prem, but SharePoint 2013. Here's what you can do. Making an Access app or Access web app using Access 2013, okay? Interface of the app being made using Access 2013. Now that app doesn't reside here, it gets launched and resides in SharePoint Online or SharePoint On-Premises as the app. But the beauty of the whole thing, I feel, is that third step here, the third thing. And those of you who can't see it because of the podium here in the way, here's what it says. SQL Server 2012 used as a backend data storage technology for the app. Your data, your views, your store procedures, your tables, all that stuff goes into SQL. A new database gets created when a new web app gets created. And then everything is stored there instead of being stored in the ACCDB or MDB database that resides on your desktop or resides on a document library. That's how it had been before, right? And then you could also link some tables, uh, from tables to lists and all that stuff. I don't know if you've ever done that. Have you, anybody done that? No? Okay, well, you could have done some of that stuff, and I did as well, but I wasn't super impressed, to be honest, at that time, because there's just all these limitations that were there, limitations with lists, limitations with the data being encapsulated within the access database that was sitting in a library. How do you, how do you get to that? How do you get that out? Now, all that stuff is in SQL. Perfect backend. We all agree? SQL, Oracle, whatever database. Of course, in this case, it has to be SQL obviously, but you know, databases, it should be there. For, for, for the actual forms and the input, everything else, perfect. Not a desktop application, but online. Makes sense. This thing, debatable, that you have to have this to actually make it, design it, launch it, and then even customize it, you have to go back there. So I'm hoping that this also will come down here so you could do all that stuff here. And there are some inklings of what's coming in the next version. Anybody going to Ignite, by the way? Ignite conference, all right. So Ignite conference is happening, Microsoft Ignite, you know the big one? It used to be SharePoint conference and now it's Ignite, it's gonna have Link and all that stuff in there. It's happening in our, it's my, in my hometown actually, in Chicago. So, see you there, <laughs> all right. In that conference, there will be some uh, things that Microsoft is supposed to announce, the new stuff or, or the roadmap, things like that. And I'm really hoping that this is one of those things where they say, all right, we're gonna go this route. There were some talks of it before and things got canceled. Uh, if you know uh, what Fossil is, anybody know? 
Not, not that fossil. <laughs> it did become a fossil. It become a fossil. Um, forms on SharePoint list, FOSL. That should never have been a fossil. That's what it was, right? So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well, but you know the story, it seems like. All right. Anyway, um, things are going to happen uh, for, the, for the better soon. That's all I can say right now. <clears throat> Let's talk about Access Web Apps. If you've not done this yet, and what I show you right now briefly you do like, uh, I would recommend that DVD that you get later, uh, the recorded demos. Look at um, Penny, Penny Coventry's demos. Uh, you can't see it right now because she's doing it right now. <laughs> she's doing it in a different room at the same time frame. But she's going deeper inside and Access Web Apps and Access 2013. I'll go brief. All right. Oh, by the way, another thing that I forgot to mention, if you have my slide deck or when you get my slide deck, I put links to demo videos in the notes. So this one, the search-based web solution, so you, can, you don't have to you know, wait for it. You can just go ahead and watch the video right away. Okay, <clears throat> um, let's do this, Access 2013. So in Access, we still have the good old blank desktop database or other desktop databases. They are still alive and well, like this one, desktop product inventory database. If I do click on it and make it, it's going to make a traditional, regular ACCDB uh, desktop, uh, what do you call that, <laughs> database, and it will put it on my PC or my file share or whatever, right? That's just regular stuff. Wherever you see this globe icon, this one and uh, oh, there's none down below. They're all desktop. Okay, so on top right here, custom, contacts, asset tracking, project management, issue tracking, all these ones are the ones that, that are web apps. So these are templates for web apps. They may or may not be on my machine. I'll find out when I actually click on it and see it. If it's not on my machine, it's going to pull it down. It's going to... Uh, you know, do whatever it needs to do over here. Let me customize it, then I can launch it. Okay. So once again, desktop databases are still alive and well, but we have custom web apps. I'll use this one since I have this open right now, task management. Uh, we'll just call this evolutions task management app. Location, obviously, is going to be either SharePoint Online or your on-prem. And all you need at this point is the URL for your site that you want to launch it to. In my case, it's going to be HTTPS, SharePointVideos.SharePoint.com. I'll put that here and create. Yeah, I see downloading templates, so I didn't have it here. It's going to download it, then it's going to push it out. Hang on <laughs> while we create your app. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I can't make it to that meeting. That was a meeting note. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully this will go fast enough. Let's see. But once it pulls it down, it has the schema of everything right here. It pushes it up. Perfect. It's doing it. <clears throat> it's going to show me right here the different tables that I have available to me. And then when I have the tables here, I can include more. I can add more additional custom tables or find tables that are already there, templated out. I can add those. And when I click on a table, it's going to show me different views for that table. I can manage that as much as I want, customize it, whatever I want to do. And after I'm done, so here it is, after I'm done, I can go ahead and push it out to the cloud. So uh, this is the two table. These are two tables that comes out of the box with that task management app. Uh, here we go. Employees, by group, list, etc. A lot of good stuff here. <clears throat> task, list, data sheet, by status. And if you wanted to, and I really hope that you will want to, edit this to move it around, to change stuff. You click on Edit. gives you another tab. And then, of course, you can add your fields, etc., or and or you can go ahead and change stuff around here. So assign to assign person. Let's do that. And if you really want to mess with somebody, you just go ahead and change fields around. Right. <laughs> that would not be good, though. Don't do that. Only do that on April 1st. Get it? No. You guys look more tired than I am. Come on. <laughs> so assigned person is this now. Percent complete is this one. Okay. 
So I'm good. And then if I wanted to, I can go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, data binding for that particular field, go ahead and change that around as well, and actions, et cetera. There's a lot you can dig into here uh, and change. And it's evolving. Yeah, this is still in its infancy. This is one of those things where it's still starting. And I'll talk about some of the limitations uh, afterwards as well. I'll do uh, one other thing here. Uh, you can add ad additional action items or action buttons also. Click on add. Let's change this one. I hope it lets me see it. Oh, here we go. So I'll say, you know what? Let's use this icon. The tooltip is going to be message and on click. Here's all different actions I could do. Edit record, delete record, new record, open pop-up, etc. I'll just say in this case, message box. And the message is going to be, don't click this button again. How's that? <laughs> all right. So save, save. Hang on, sure, I'll hang on. Once it's done, I'll go ahead and launch it. Uh, and that's the launch. Hopefully it's done. <laughs> okay, launch app. Depending on your connection. Here we go, this one's pretty fast actually. So it launched it uh, under my site collection here. In this case, tasks, employees are the two, <clears throat> the two uh, tables that I have obviously. When I go into it, task, for example, here's my new button, message box, tooltip. I'll click on it. It's going to say, don't click this button again. Uh, one thing I wanted to also show, by the way, aside from the regular you know, thing, that it, this is just regular uh, form, obviously. It's a nice, lightweight form. When you do click on a field, it shows you the corresponding label for it. So you know how we try to fool somebody by moving this around? It's not going to be easy to fool because when you click on this, the assigned person gets highlighted. So it's a little bit more user friendly, just in case somebody messes around with the form. Hopefully nobody does. Now, <clears throat> a good lightweight web app is what this is right now. If you're thinking, you know what, I can make some awesome enterprise application using this thing, my suggestion is going to be to wait a little bit because you will hit some uh, barriers, for example, in branding. For example, in uh, managing the fields around and making it look the way you want it to look. For example, in uh, hiding sections, depending on if something is going out, like you know we used to do with InfoPath, uh, or more process automation. So in here, if I wanted to say, when the status changes here, go ahead and assign this particular app or this uh, the form to the manager, right? Let him or her approve it. Those kind of things don't exist yet. This is a great starting point, I think, and it is being used uh, somewhat by some of the clients, some of our clients, but it's more in its infancy, maturing slowly. A lot of stuff is supposed to mature online regarding this thing, and I'm hopeful, but that's where it is right now, okay? Also remember one more thing. You know how uh, <laughs> file shares become that uh, hole where everybody throws stuff in and then five years down the road you're like, okay, what is all this stuff? And then you realize 80% of that thing is just garbage and 20% is good stuff. Hopefully it's not that high of a percentage, but I've seen that happen also. This can happen with this as well. Every time you make a new web app, it makes a new database. Okay? In this case, it made a database in SQL Azure. If you do it on your on-prem environment, it's going to make it on your SQL box, whatever SQL box you point to when you, when you set up access services, which is good in a way because you know, it's all comprised in one database. You can structure it the way you want. You can do reports on it, whatever you want to do. But if somebody starts playing around with it, hey, what is this? Though? What is this? Then you can have that many databases sitting around idle, uh, not really doing anything. So I would recommend not having everybody... <laughs> Not letting everybody make these, first of all. Uh, second of all, when you do make it, make it for a specific purpose, have a good lifetime for it, and then always think about what's going to happen in the future for it, which we'll know more about in Ignite, hopefully, as well. All right, so play safe. It's a really promising technology, but it's not completely there yet, in my opinion. Sorry, Microsoft. But it, it's getting there. It's definitely getting there. All right. <clears throat> there is more. Let's talk about more stuff over here. So... Oh, by the way, so for access, for this access apps in SharePoint Online, there is a way to disable it. 
Until you're ready, I would recommend disable it. But once you are ready, it does have some good promise, especially for lightweight applications, enable it and use it wisely. That's where the setting is to do that. Uh, for on-prem, you just, you do, if you're not ready, don't install the service. It's access service, right? Access service app. I have a couple of slides here which I won't dig deep into, but I just want to throw it here so you have it for reference. Uh, some of the solutions that we have created in the past that I've seen created also without code, for example, financial dashboard, expense reporting, onboarding of employees, tracking goods, services, asset tracking, uh, review and approval of documents and stuff like that. So all these things and a whole lot more can be done without code. Just wanted to show some examples here. Yeah? Having said that, <clears throat> let's go dig into some more stuff. Workflows. SharePoint workflows have come a long way. Uh, I don't know how many of you were involved in SharePoint 2003. I think 2003. There were no workflows. Do you remember that? Anybody? Right? Am I? There was no workflow, right? So there was no workflows. In 2007, workflows came. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if I have my timeline right, I started working with in SharePoint 2001. There was definitely no workflows. 2003, I'm pretty sure there was no workflows. 2007, we had workflows, but they were still very, very lightweight. 2010 became much, much stronger especially in SharePoint Designer and Visual Studio. That was where the real workflow story started taking off, I think. In 2013, it gets even further up. So now in SharePoint 2013, we have all these tools to make workflows, browser, SharePoint Designer, Visio, and also Visual Studio. I'm gonna focus on these three over here just to show you some quick examples. Now, for SharePoint 2013 type of workflows, you need something called a workflow manager. You guys heard of that? Okay. So Workflow Manager runs in its own farm. And that farm, that Workflow Manager farm, it provides workflow services to SharePoint. That's how it works in here. And that's what this first point is saying. Yeah, processing move to SharePoint uh, Workflow Manager runs in its own farm and then it provides services there. Now farm, you know, some people think, oh farm, that means like two, five hundred servers. No, it doesn't have to be, it could be a one. A farm could be one virtual server with one gig of memory. It's possible, you know? So the SharePoint farm and the workflow manager can reside on the same box if you really, really, really wanted to. But I would recommend never do that in production. Because what's going to happen is whenever workflows start running and they get ramped up uh, uh, quite a bit, your regular SharePoint stuff, your, the queries that get returned, the search that's happening, the navigation that's happening, all that stuff is going to start slowing down. All right? Uh, I would recommend Workflow Manager always run its own farm and its own server. In development, though, if you're doing prototyping, development, stuff like that, definitely put it together. And that's what I do in my end as well. Put it together, test it out, don't do it in production. So the new stuff that comes with SharePoint 2013 workflow. First, stages. Pretty cool, I think. You have different stage. Within a stage, you have actions and conditions. And then you go from stage to stage, maybe its own stage or some other stage, etc. Visual designer, not everybody thinks in just regular text-based uh, workflow, you know, you know workflow uh, text-based design. So we have Visio and also Visio components within SharePoint Designer that you can use to make your workflows or to edit the workflows. New task actions available there as well. Web services gets a little bit deeper now. More development stuff. Uh, development. A focus, I would say developer focus, the ability to call web services. Loops, functionality to loop things. And my favorite, copy, cut, and paste. <laughs> right? Even though it seems like such a small thing, what? Copy, cut, and paste. We didn't have that until now. So thank God, now we do. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to show you a couple more pictures here, then I'll dive into it and show it to you in SharePoint Designer. You can still make SharePoint 2010 type of workflows in SharePoint 2013. Once again, you can still make SharePoint 2010 type of workflows in SharePoint 2013. And for that, you don't need Workflow Manager. And this is what it looks like. If you go to SharePoint Designer, you get the same ribbon that we got in SharePoint Designer 2010. The only difference is this right here, which is the copy, cut, and paste. So now you can actually do copy, cut, and paste even for SharePoint 2010 type of workflows, which is great. For SharePoint 2013 type of workflows, once you have Workflow Manager involved, you get things like loops, stages, app step, different views, visual view, text view, etc. 
But you know what? Now that looks so exciting, so I want to just go ahead and show it to you. <clears throat> Seeing is much better, I think. Hopefully it lets me get in without any issues. You know how much SharePoint Designer costs? What was that? Zero? Well, it depends. If you break a site using SharePoint Designer, <laughs> it costs you a lot of money. You know? I've done that. <laughs> So, yes, it is the acquisition cost for SharePoint Designer is zero. How you use it and what becomes of it could be thousands. Please be careful. It's a very, very powerful tool. It does amazing, awesome things, but um, just be careful. That's all I can say. Um, within SharePoint Designer, I'm going to go specifically to workflows and have a few workflows already there. Here we go. Uh, if you want to make a new workflow, List workflow, reusable workflow, site workflow. Once you make it, you attach it to something. For example, list workflow, let's attach to announcement. <clears throat> let's do a quick one. Announcement approval. Now, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and go a little bit quickly. Uh, just slow me down if I am going too fast, all right? Announcement approval, SharePoint 2013 type of workflow. OK. Oh, because I already have another one like that. Okay, stage. Within a stage, I'll throw a couple of actions in there. Here we go. Uh, these look a lot more pleasing when I have a bigger screen, by the way. Okay, but currently I have to go in here and then go in there. These all appear directly on the ribbon. Action, here's all different actions. Let's do a log to history list. Log a message. Workflow started. Let's put another insert action uh, comment. No, no, actually, let's do a status. Set workflow status. So I can put a status here saying uh, approval of announcement started, something like that. Let's change this also. <clears throat> approval started. So this is my stage right here, right? I'll throw in an action here too called assign a task. There's always going to be some tasks in there in the approval. So we'll do that. <clears throat> this task action has become pretty powerful, I think. When I click on this user link here, it gives me the dialog where I can say, first of all, which participant do I want? I can go ahead and pick anybody from my site, from my site collection, actually. So Garth Fort, I'll use this person. And then task title, I'll use this bigger, I'll use this ellipsis to get a bigger box. And in here I'm going to say uh, approve announcement dash. And then I'll say, let's do a lookup. In this lookup, I'll use the current item. This, because we're attached to the announcement list, it's current announcement is what it's saying. And then I'll use the title column from that as string, correct. So now it's going to give me this as the subject of the task that gets assigned to the person. Approve announcement dash the announcement title. Yeah? OK. Uh, a description if I want it to be for the task. That's fine right now. Due date. Task options. <clears throat> Wait for task to complete before going forward in the workflow or uncheck it, let it go in parallel. Up to you. Email option, one of my favorite things here. I can click on the open email editor and change this around. So I can say, not just statically you have a new task, but also who's the culprit that assigned you the task, right? <laughs> you have a new task from, let's do a lookup. And in this case, the lookup is going to be from this one right here, workflow context. From the workflow context, the person who initiated the workflow OK, so initiator. And then I can use their login name, display name, whatever. So I'll say display name. And here we go. Workflow, context, initiator. Click OK. And then other stuff you can do in here as well. For example, send task overdue emails. And also the outcome options. Currently, outcome options are only approved or rejected. But if you wanted to, you can go ahead and change the task outcome field, which is a site column to have additional outcomes, like pending or deferred or something like that. 
All right, okay here. Did I click on it again? Okay, so this was done. Uh, the transition state, we don't have any other states, so really I can't do anything here. <clears throat> but uh, if I did, I can put in go to a stage. Currently, it's just the two options, itself or end of workflow. So I'll throw a couple of stages in here. Insert stage. This stage is going to be approved. And in here, I'll, you can start typing it in also. You don't have to go to the button every time. So set workflow status to be approved. Excuse me. Transition to stage. Go to end of workflow. Now, here's what I wanted to show you <clears throat> specifically. Uh, what happens in reality is you're going to have these stages which are going to have lots of actions and conditions and complex stuff that's going on. You will not want to re <laughs> uh, make the whole thing again by, by hand. You know, you want to copy some of these things. So you click on the stage or the action or the condition or whatever you want to click on. Click on copy, go to the bottom, and then click on paste. Just like regular word paste. Now, this just says stage name is already used. So you go ahead and uh, change the stage name to something else. <clears throat> and of course, I got to go in and change this stuff around. Rejected. Uh, and that's about it. I'll go up here, and instead of just saying go to a particular stage, I'll delete this action and put a condition here. Insert condition if any value equals value. The value I'm looking for is going to be coming from variables and parameters, specifically this parameter right here, outcome. So outcome, pull the outcome from the task. It's going to be either approved or rejected. If it's approved, go to approved. Otherwise, go to rejected. Oops. Make sense? OK, <clears throat> simple workflow. I do have a complex workflow also in here. And in fact, uh, in the slide deck, it has a link to that complex workflow, which uses dictionary variable, uses call to web services, uses loops, uses lots of oh, stages, everything, things like that. So do check it out in the slide deck as well. There's a whole video on that too, from beginning to end. I've had people tell me after conferences that, man, that was really helpful because I followed that workflow a couple of times and I was able to build my own workflow with all these things. So that might be helpful to you if you want to dig into this thing. But for now, we're done. Uh, one thing I want to show you is you can do all this stuff pictorially, visually as well by going to Views, Visual Designer. For this, you do need Visio on your computer, Visio 2013. If you have Visio 2013, it's going to take the Visio 2013 components and bring this within SharePoint Designer. I don't know if you noticed, but this is still SharePoint Designer. This is not Visio. It's using Visio components within SharePoint Designer. Yeah? So now I have uh, all these things here, actions, conditions, et cetera. Let me zoom in a little bit so I can show this to you. And if I wanted to change some stuff around, like assigning a task, I can go ahead and say, you know what? I want to change the properties. I want to change whatever I want to change. I can change it directly here. You see, everything is there. Yeah? So it's not just pretty pictures, but you can actually go ahead and make stuff with it as well. And, and uh, one thing I would recommend is not have a small screen like this to make it in. It's going to get frustrating, so you want to have a bigger screen. Otherwise, it works nicely. All right. <clears throat> so that's a preview of what you can do here. There's so much more I can show you, but uh, we're going to run out of time pretty soon here. But that's workflows in a nutshell. I'm going to skip over a couple of these things here. because I do want to talk about this guy right here. Info path. <laughs> uh, we're going to be doing a session at the Ignite conference. And since nobody else is coming to Ignite except you, one gentleman over here, I'm going to tell you what we're probably going to be doing. So this InfoPath thing, I don't know how many people, how many people use InfoPath right now? It's kind of like that white elephant that nobody wants to talk about. So we're thinking about getting a white elephant, you know, bringing it up like, oh, we're going to talk about InfoPath now. Because this, this thing, unfortunately, uh, has been an amazing thing, amazing uh, product for a long time with its caveats, with its issues, et cetera, yes. But it's still been an amazing product, which was a true form solution for library forms, list forms, even workflow forms in SharePoint, and more. 
And now it's kind of gone, right? It's being deprecated is the right word for it. So now what do you do? Well, this is a slide that Microsoft had put up a couple of years, a year and a half back in a SharePoint conference that four different scenarios you could do that you currently do in InfoPath. <clears throat> I'll start from the bottom. The app forms right here. This is the Access Web Apps that I showed you. Okay? So Access Web Apps have taken some of the functionality for InfoPath and it's growing from it. This top one right here is also available, Excel surveys, uh, but it's Excel based and it's for surveys. Okay, so it's a pretty specific thing that it accomplishes. Excel online surveys, Excel uh, and does it on SharePoint online and also SharePoint uh, on-prem. These two things, not out. Okay, uh, this fossil what we're talking about here forms on SharePoint list, which was very promising for structural, for specific reasons, which I can't completely go into too much right now, but it's been canceled, at least delayed indefinitely. And I'm really hoping that at Ignite Conference, Microsoft will come around and say, all right, here's what we're doing about this. The other thing, which was structured documents, word-based, but much more powerful, that just did not happen. So the story right now is kind of, kind of broken, unfortunately. You know? And I tell this to Microsoft as well, that we got to fix this thing together. It's not us or Microsoft like that. It's together. Uh, and hopefully, we're coming up with a good solution for that, because we need it. <clears throat> This was going to be Fossil. Fossil was going to be taking the place of InfoPath, what you could do with list form modification. So you go into a list, you click on customize form, and then this would come up, and it would let you customize the form of that list right there in the browser without needing any other tool. Makes complete sense. And it will happen. Eventually, this will happen. It just didn't happen yet, unfortunately. That's what got canceled. It became a Fossil, like you said. It was all because of the name. You're right. <laughs> anyway, so what do you do now if you're using InfoPath? Here's what I tell my clients. Take it for what it's worth. It's up to you. If you're already using InfoPath, continue using it. There is no other solution that's better than that in the Microsoft framework. Nothing. OK? If you can use some of the other features like Access Web Apps and Excel, stuff like that for certain uh, case scenarios, use those. Otherwise, continue using InfoPath. What if we're starting out fresh on forms for Microsoft Technologies? What do we do then? Then I usually recommend InfoPath is still an option, but it will not grow. So if your feature set that is there right now, if it's going to be good for the next seven, eight years, fine. Otherwise, look for some third party. There's a bunch of good third parties out, uh, solutions out there. They cost additional money, of course. <clears throat> or make .NET based forms. That does require, of course, uh, coding, which has become easier in Visual Studio 2013 now. Uh, or 2015? I don't know what the, the latest version. I don't keep up anymore with Visual Studio. But it is becoming easier, but still requires coding. So that's the option, options right now. And I'm hoping in a month or so, things will change for the better with some other additional announcements. So as I close some of these things out, more no-code ideas. But some of these now are only available in SharePoint 2013 on, premise, on premises, not on online. Uh, for example, <clears throat> location mapping using geolocation column. Anybody did this yet? No? You can actually map out different things. You know, if you give a, the coordinates in a list, you can map that stuff out, completely driven by Bing Maps in here. All built-in functionality that many people don't know about. There's a link here, too, at the bottom, where you can see exactly how to make this happen. Additionally, dynamic dashboards using PowerView. Uh, creating KPIs and stuff like that, and more dashboards using performance point. That's still alive and well as, uh, also. And additional more, more <laughs> dashboards and more things like that using Power Pivot. Uh, Power Pivot <clears throat> using uh, SQL Server Power Pivot, I should say, is, is also a very, very powerful functionality that's been around for a while now. And project-based solutions. Uh, that's something also that's uh, many, many people need it. Many organizations need it. If you have Project 2013, you can do a lot of that stuff already without even Project Server. Not maybe this detail, uh, but you can do a lot of good stuff with Project 2013 and SharePoint 2013 or SharePoint Online. If you have Project Server, even further. You could do a lot more that you can do uh, within SharePoint. So look into that. All these solutions, uh, in fact, all these screenshots, I just stole it from our own website with uh, all these instructors, awesome instructors who have done 
Uh, a lot of good tutorials on our site, so they're all coming from there. So if you want to check it out on our site, visualsp.com, you'll find all these there. And let's see, one last thing here is, <clears throat> where do I go if I need more information aside from this slide deck? There's a link that I provided here. Uh, this composite solution uh, for your, uh, aggregation portal, aggregated portal, whatever you want to call it, was created by a guy named Mark Gillis from Microsoft. And in here, he continues to put more and more pointers to no-code solutions out there in the community. So when you click on, for example, BI Excel, and you click on one of these links over here, it will take you to either a video or a specific article or some other kind of uh, pre-built demo, something like that, to a particular solution. Very helpful, I think. All right, that's about it. So I'm going to do the raffle in just a minute. But first of all, I want to go ahead and say thank you very much for sticking around and uh, listening. And I hope it was well worth your time. So thank you.